Welcome to show 101. Can you believe it? We've stayed consistent in this weekly show, Silver Lining for Learning, bringing in guests from around the world. And tonight is one of the best shows we'll have because we have people from South America, North America, Africa, and Asia. We're bringing together four people who have been on this show. This is the only show in which we are bringing guests back because they were so delightful the first time. We had to hear more from them and what's happened in their lives since they've been on this show. And so we're gonna get a little sampling uh, from, from different uh, perspectives and see where this show leads. We do not have a goal in mind tonight. We do not have a direction. We do not have a pathway or a journey. We're gonna hear about four pathways and journeys. They're all unique. And we'll see if we can create some themes across those journeys. We can see if we can connect some of the folks together and write a grant by the time this show's done. I think we've started on the pre-show writing grants together. So we'll see where that goes. But I hope our audience can jump in too with some questions for us, some comments, because they've been with us for 101 shows. They've been with us for more than two years now because we started on March 21st, of 2020 and and those those people who are in the in the chat window in in uh, uh, YouTube please please uh, make some comments and questions because we will address them tonight we will want to, to have the show go where you want to go just like you were on our show last week if you didn't watch the show 100 take a look at it take a look at our all prior shows uh, that we've had here and use them in your classes so this will kickstart us into the next 100 with these four guests talks, which we'll hear from her and her, her work in both Africa and in the Boston area and all around the world. And we'll hear from my good friend and graduate school colleague, Okwa Lee, who was the TA in my first graduate class I took with Rich Lair. Uh, and then she conveniently left for Korea after finishing that class uh, as a TA. And I'm delighted I got to meet up with her again. And we're here from Sean Lesher, who's working with Punya and changing dramatically education and reform movements in North America and getting people to think about what's possible, both during the pandemic as well as after. And he will provide us with um, a lot of thought tools, mind tools as we go through tonight. Uh, and Gabrielle will be coming to us from South America and I thank him for repeat and coming back with us. Uh, and Shang A, our co-host for the you know, for this um, podcast, this webcast. In fact, our sponsor, East China Normal University and the journal Review of Education, uh, ECNU Review of Ed, which is an open access journal, which I highly recommend you read. Chang'e is the um, editor and in charge of that and really is the reason we got started. And so I think we should really, uh, with show 101, start with Chang'e and just for a minute or two, could you explain um, why you got us together, first of all, what got you to, to uh, think about doing a podcast webcast and, and tell us about the journal uh, so people might want to publish in. Um, yeah, this is the 101. I can't imagine that. That's uh, really totally beyond my imagination. Yeah, because I ne uh, initiated this idea. I just uh, talked to with Xiong. Um, I think that just uh, in the uh, 2020, um, but uh, it turned out 2022 is really kind of a 2022. The um, at least the for uh, for us uh, living in Shanghai, um, so it's kind of I don't want to take it as kind of replication. Uh, when we initiated that, we just think okay, okay, it might be a kind of experimentation, and we never experienced at least in our lifetime this kind of a could be a kind of large scale endemic. And it may not be the pandemic, but we don't know. And so we just, uh, well, how about we, we have a kind of a show to talk about it. And uh, I think Yong is more brave and uh, I think the more visionary and to make it, okay, let's make it as uh, if uh, this could last for one year. Well, we, we thought, okay, how could that be? How could this last for one year? And uh, it turned out it lasted for more than two years. And I think this even more dramatic that in China or in Shanghai cases, in Shanghai case that uh, 
um, <laughs> Shanghai uh, turned out to be uh, performed very well in 2020 and 2021, but it turned out to be the first, I think, the largest city in human history. Uh, we are experiencing that as uh, uh, 26 million people locked down. I think at least a half of them locked for 14 days. And uh, we have been locked for 10 days, the whole city, for two more uh, 200 million people that. So I think um, there is always could be um, incidents and accidents like pandemic that, that act as this kind of a disruption in our life, in uh, learning. But uh, I think that uh, exactly from the, this show, we involve the people around the world. And I think that we could have a more um, further and elaborative discussion about uh, those um, taken for granted idea. For example, uh, learning loss. Do we really um, uh, lose something? Or we'll use this kind of occasion, just like as the name for civil learning, for learning. That is, on the other hand, on the other hand, how can how can we perceive um, this uh, uh, crisis and disruption in another way, like as kind of opportunity? I think this is a kind of essential idea I got from this show, from this. Uh, so I would like this one o one to continue this idea yeah and for our journal our journal is uh ecnu review of education is saying you as kind of abbreviation for our university is china normal universe uh, normal university it's a bit awkward to remember that but i think that, um it's just to represent um kind of uh, our university uh, our spirit to support this open access science yeah and uh, it's mainly kind of a more uh, into uh, all the general uh, education issues, but the more cutting uh, edge uh, discussion in education. So education technology is also a kind of a thing that uh, we would like to advance and support. Yeah, later on, I will put the link uh, of our journal there. Yeah. And who's covering Thank the YouTube you. okay. channel can, yeah, sure. And who's covering the YouTube channel can put the link that Shang-Yi puts in to those folks who are watching. Um, what I would like to do is to go around to everyone, not give us your bios, because you've been on the show before. What we need is an update. What have you been up to since you've been on the show? Or what kinds of, what have you thought about? What have you been pushing or writing about since the show was on in terms of education, in terms of new models, uh, in terms of new ways of thinking about teaching and learning. And so we probably should go around and start with uh, talks. I mean, she's probably the youngest one who's here. And we'll, we'll start with her and we'll wrap around maybe ladies first, Opa next, and then Gabrielle and then Sean. And, and also, you know, it, you could comment on learning loss, which Sean A brought up. Uh, uh, that's one topic of many that you could be commenting on, but whatever you like as a way to get us started. Talks? Sure. Um, so, I think that uh, uh, definitely a lot has happened in, since since the start of the pandemic, but also since episode, I think I was in episode 19, which was around July of 2020. So, so certainly a lot um, has definitely happened for me since then. One of the things um, that has happened is an ability to live multi-lives <laughs> um, in a way that I wasn't expecting. So before I, I, I came to the US, before the pandemic, I always had um, sort of a, a collection of different skills I could do. So as an educator with kids, and then I had this um, passion for virtual reality and kind of emerging technologies. And those were, were separate things that I was doing at, at, at different points in my, in my life. But then during the pandemic, somehow, I think because I was able to work remotely because, you know, of all the things that, that the, I was stuck in one place only, um, I I sud suddenly started having like multi lives that were all happening in parallel with each other at the same time, and I'm sure like you know lots of you were were, were doing were felt felt the same, um, and and so for me I think what as a result of that one of the things that I've I've been driving very much um, is that 
you have to make the most of the tools that you have and 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 in spite of what they are you will you will still um succeed and you will push through so for example for some of the children i worked with um you know i was very very adamant that even with like just using zoom we were gonna continue to have therapy sessions for example um for some of the children that i couldn't support directly supporting their parents because at least they could pick up the phone and and you know and i could do that with them so i I think that that's been huge for me is is that um, you it doesn't matter kind of what's in front of you you can use the tools that you've got but then also just this ability now to to do all of the things almost at the same time I think has been has been really really uh, uh, telling and and has been definitely very different from from what it was before. Thank you. Uh, Okwa. We've had, by the way, had a little celebration for on February 28th, March 1st in Korea, when she sort of retired, but she's really not. <laughs> Thank you very much for my uh, retirement uh, ceremony on your uh, TV show. <laughs> um, when this pandemic broke, uh, the educational technologists were very busy. We were called by media, we are called by uh, government officers and educators and you know, many sectors in education. But very quickly, uh, I think education, uh, uh, educational technologists lost the identity. People in other fields jumped in how this, uh, how we cope with uh, this pandemic um, uh, situation with the technology in education. Very quickly, they started to talk about and they uh, 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 representing how that uh, uh, new technology can, can uh, survive their work uh, efficiently. So before this pandemic, uh, when the uh, use of uh, ICT in education was a job, very, very sole job for educational technologist. But very quickly, <laughs> it is no more. So we lost, um, you know, this is too harsh to say that we lost uh, that uh, area, but we share that area with many uh, uh, other educators. Then uh, it, is, it is the time for me to think what can be the unique uh, area of expertise for education technologists when everybody in education talk about how to, how to um, uh, improve uh, instruction with uh, means of uh, technology and, and with means of something. So I think we need to, this is a time to think about what we can do uh, uh, with with what specialty we can do for uh, education, uh, and that was a big uh, topic for me, and I think that's why I retire. <laughs> and um, as a as a retiree, I have the time to go back and and see how the history, uh, what the history says to uh, uh, educational technologists for uh, coping with this new big change. And I learned that uh, educational technologists did a lot of work in developing and improving uh, the education system in any countries. For example, Korea was one of the big recipient of that uh, uh, approach. Many years ago, actually, uh, the report written by Morgan, Professor Morgan, in 1971, uh, said that uh, uh, Korea needs Korean education has uh, 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 problems or issues, da -da 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 -da, and in order to improve, in order to uh, solve that uh, uh, issues. 
you can think of this kind of things. Da -da 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 -da. So we could, educational technologists could analyze the educational situation, educational issues in one country and, and suggest uh, what we can do. And that was uh, beautifully done by educational technologists. So I think it's a time to go back and think what we can do for uh, better education, better uh, instruction in one country. Uh, and I, I was very happy to find that educational technologists that did a lot of work to improve uh, the education system uh, in one country. Yep. So I thank you, Okwa, and I apologize for Tokes. I, I, I said I mispronounced. So thank you, uh, Okwa and Tokes. And we're going to move to Gabrielle, who's from Argentina, and it was on show 41, Making Education Change a Reality. Um, Gabrielle from Argentina. And Gabrielle's um, a co-founder and director of Learner Space, a consulting company seeking to impact education, advocating, advocating for educational change. He's also co-founder of the Global School, the first school of its type in Latin America, attempting to make those educational changes. So we'll probably hear some common themes between what Sean's going to say and what Gabriel's going to say. And then Oka and Talks might want to comment on it. We'll have questions from Chris and from Punya and Young. But, you know, so I didn't properly introduce, we have Young Zhao, who really instigated us to, to, to do this show. So Young, thank you. He'll be asking questions from Melbourne. Uh, Punya Mishra from ASU in uh, Tempe and Chris Didi from uh, Harvard in the Boston area. So, Gabriel. Yeah, thanks, Kurt, and thanks for the invitation. As, as you mentioned, um, we operate at two levels, uh, a school that intends to simply make true on what we already know about uh, learning for the future. Uh, we never say that we are an innovative school because that's one of the one of the testimonies of the sad state of education is that doing the right thing is considered to be innovative. So we just have a school that uh, counterculturally tries to implement what we all know about education, student-centered learning, technology for learning, uh, student agency, global connections, uh, developing some of the quote-unquote softer skills, et cetera. And as you also mentioned, we also work with educators, administrators in, in trying to develop anything, events, uh, projects, initiatives, designs, et cetera, that, that target innovation. Uh, in that case, we unashamedly talk about innovation as an inspiration to educators and administrators who, who want to lead their schools. Um, and during during this period, we first, uh, so at both levels, both at the school level and then working with educators, first it was about interpreting the native language of the digital medium, of the online medium, meaning that one of the greater risks in navigating this uh, thankfully temporary period when we were all forced to go online was digitizing the traditional model and that was a uh, you know uh, uh, an obvious failed proposition because it was not only cumbersome but it was also uh, a kind of very very defeatist proposition to try to do the same thing we were doing online it made it uh, even even more more tedious more more boring so we worked on trying to develop uh, learning interactions that were native to the medium and then trying to extrapolate those to try to help people in other schools uh, get the, the DNA of that. As the pandemic gradually kind of eased off, our biggest challenge, the one that we face now is, how do we go back to the future and not to the past? How do we empower learners at the school level, administrators, teachers, uh, so that this period where we learned online was not in vain and we can take forward some of the lessons learned, which were are, are very clear, uh, even though the, the sense of perspective of the pandemic still needs to be developed after a few more years. But we already know that many lessons were hard learned during this period. So how do we take those and, and apply them to the, the physical environment of schools now? And how do we work with educators and, and, and school leaders uh, to try to make that happen in, in, in the future, in, in, in going back to the future. That's what we're doing, and that's where we're at now. Um, regarding the, the phrase learning loss, I want to address that very brief, briefly. Uh, I think that's a great example of how we educators uh, shoot ourselves on the foot. Like, uh, that is a very unfortunate phrase. Nobody who goes through a life-threatening crisis that makes you grow and learn harder lessons thinks about what they lost. They think, they think about what they gained. And the press and the media are all concerned with what we lost. What can we do about it? 
Is there anything, can we go back and turn back time? Our, was this a crisis of our own creation? So it, it really gets me when uh, the media starts discussing or people start writing papers about learning loss. That's none of our concern right now. We should make the best of what we've learned and look ahead and not to the past. And I think that's part of the problem. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a trivial issue, uh, how we communicate, how we fail to capture the imagination of our public in terms of the promise of the future of education. So we move to Sean uh, Losher, who's coming to us, I believe, from Los Angeles. Um, he can correct me if I'm wrong. He was on episode 10, Crisis, Drift, and New Paradigms for Public Education. And I believe he had an award-winning dissertation at Arizona State. And he's also been uh, part of TED or TED Ed, uh, Innovative Educators. And has been one of the people th rethinking um, urban schools. And he had something, uh, chief executive officer of urban discovery schools, which I, I believe he's moved from. I, I, I'm not positive about this, but he can fill us in if he's changed jobs or changed roles anyhow, uh, since he was on the show almost two years ago. So Sean, uh, yeah, two year update. That might be a little monumental because you're doing stuff every day, right? So why don't you go ahead, Sean? Well, thank you very much for having me back. And yes, episode 10 seems like a very long time ago. And yet also, thanks to the, uh, the blur of the pandemic, seems like just yesterday, um, in many ways that we were sitting together and talking about these things. And specifically from episode 10, we were talking about uh, rapid response frameworks uh, to dealing with the emergent situation and uh, the rapid response framework to share with our friends at Silver Lining actually uh, ended up being featured in a number of conferences and places um, to help other schools uh, and help them adapt and school systems adapt in terms of what they can do immediately regarding uh, school change. I still am at, Ur at Urban Discovery and I'm very happy at Urban Discovery. Uh, and there are a few other things that, that are uh, being discussed right now, but we'll save that for a, another day in time. Um, I didn't want to fire you or anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, not at all. Uh, I, I think for me, you know, I'm going to concur with our friends regarding uh, the notion of learning loss. I, I think there's a lot of things there that I think have been put on the table in the pandemic. And I think as we move from a time period where we refer to this as a pandemic to a time period where this is, this is our life, this is a, how we're proceeding in life, that this is with us. Um, there are certain things that I think this time period has taught us. Um, one thing that this time period has effectively done, it has uncoupled a lot of aspects of schooling for K-12 education, at least, that got confused. You know, things like academic development versus social emotional learning. If you're in North American schools, the aspect of equity that schools are to represent, the aspects of social services, where a lot of schools act as the social service centers for food distribution and medical distribution resources and a lot of other things that go with it. And, and that time period really blew that wide open for so many of us and revealed what schools did, not only in that sense, but also how schools impact the economy for parents to be able to participate in the economy and laid bare in front of us gender equity issues regarding who would be expected to take care of the children and, and how it disproportionately impacted mothers as opposed to fathers throughout the pandemic. So a lot of these things have been brought to bear and laid bare in front of us. One other thing it did that was fascinating, for me at least, is it, it completely took off the table the notion that school could really only be done in one way. Now, you, you don't have to like necessarily what we did in the pandemic, but the notion that you could only do it one way, that's been, that's been taken off the table. It can be done in any number of ways, including you can choose to have a different funding model for schools, for example, I'm out here in California, there was no seat time for schools for over a year. We, we didn't get paid for seat time at all. We simply were looking at engagement, how often students were engaging and engagement precedes learning, right? So that's a more logical way of even looking at what we're doing in order to facilitate learning. I think that the real thing that look as we look ahead is what are the great lessons that we can learn from this last two year period inside of education, whether it be through education technology and 
and I have to agree agree with our fellow panelists. You know that that title of learning technologists. We're all a little bit learning technologists now. That identity has dispersed out, and we appreciate that. And with that, we embrace now learning technologists as co-educators. They're not a set aside thing. They're they're part of the core team of what we're doing now, which is a good thing, and should have always been. But the question is, what can we take with us from this time period that we can build upon? Whether it be from funding models of education, looking at the importance of socio-emotional learning as a prerequisite to academic success. What are the ways that we can move forward and adapt to new styles of, of working that parents are having in different parts of the world? And how do we continue to progress our talks and not simply seek out a new normal by a regression, which is a term we like in education, a regression to previous models where it might feel more comfortable for people at first. But I think the real question on the table that we have to put in front of us is, I don't think we were all that pleased with most of the outcomes we were getting beforehand. So I'm not sure why we would try and replicate that again and instead try and embrace all of the great lessons that we've learned here and find a new way forward. Right, so before we jump to Young here, could you give us the 15 second um, to, uh, ideas about how you're measuring engagement? What, what are some metrics for engagement? Sure, there's all different metrics for engagement. There's time spent online, there's number of assignments turned in. You can measure online uh, the amount that people are reading, page turns, word counts, assignments that are, are, are turned in and in terms of the depth of what's happening. But again, when you backed off of that discussion that learning is somehow coupled to time in the classroom, which we've known is not so. Some people learn very quickly in the classroom. Some people take longer. That's not what's important. When we turn more towards engagement and, and pay attention to how often students are engaging in various aspects of school, what we find is an opportunity to have a discussion about why aren't we trying? Why aren't we engaging? Why, why aren't we, we going after this? And that gets to a different conversation. And in that conversation, we get to a, a more of a root cause issue versus why are you late? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you talking in class? Right. And we've had many shows where we've talked about the principles for, of, of the learning environments that we can create that are more engaging. In fact, a couple of recent shows, if people are watching, just the, the, in the past two months, we've had several shows with principals from Australia and other places talking just about that. Young is going to jump in here. Young? All right. It's just uh, fascinating to hear uh, the different uh, experiences and perspectives. Uh, I just want to jump in with uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think there is a strong really sense of disorientation. So I, I, I came to Australia about two weeks ago, and I thought I was going to have a, a lot of meetings, but when I went to the meetings, we were still doing online. So the University of, of Melbourne here have made it, uh, you know, um, people that you, you don't have to come. So a lot of the research centers here, some people come, a lot of people don't come. It's very interesting. I, you know, was, I, I think people are still reorienting themselves to a new reality. And there's a lot of baggage there. I think, Sean, that may be happening in your schools and Gabriel, in your schools. I visited a school, elementary school. They had like 25 faculty, I mean, prof I mean teachers. Nine were missing because they were isolated you know, from, from quarantine. It's a, it's a lot of disorientation. I think we need to think about that because we are approaching a new reality. Another thing I think I've um, had learned is that there are schools at least in Australia and in some other countries, are specifically learning the lessons from online. So they are requiring at least every month a student should learn online a day, you know, actually, which, which is actually quite, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily impose that, but I think, re, you know, my view is reflecting on what we could do. I love what Gabriel said about learning loss. I mean, it's a, it's a manufactured concept. It's a silly idea, but people, seem to be stuck with that. But I think it is about the future. I, th I think also Shuang Ye said something that's really interesting. We need to remember. Uh, I, I also, our uh, talks on Oka, they all kind of commented on this one thing. Oka mentioned this too, is that uh, to this educators are really different from two years ago. We, we really have to accept that. They are 
But are we taking advantage of that difference or are we driving them back? That, that's something. And then the, the actually, my main the reason I want to come to jump in is uh, as uh, Kurt was talking about, this is 101. So we are setting up a really new movement into the future. So I want to really highlight a few things. You know, the, the, uh, the, the original hosts of this had some bias. You know, we don't, I don't say we agree with everything we say. You know, I, I mean, Chris and Pronia and Shangyi and Kurt, we, uh, I don't think we agree on everything. But there are some biases we are promoting in this show, okay? It's, I just want to lay that out so we can seek, at least from my perspective, bias number one, we all believe students can learn. We all believe students can learn online, students can learn with technology, and drive their own learning, students can be creative, students can be entrepreneurs. So, so the, the centrality, centrality of students are key in, in our show. So I would hope we'll get more students, students initiated, students activated projects on. And uh, the second thing I think we, 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 we have been debating a little bit about how do you change schools? How do you change school leaders? How do you prepare teachers? How do you do this? My view is that these are important, but we have students in front of all of us today. We cannot let anyone go. So how do we develop a system in the future that can direct and offer learning opportunities to individual students without being filtered by the adults in the system? I think now our school system, when we try to fix it, we try to change it. Do you remember we had a show from Peter Hutton and Michael Ha a few weeks ago and talking about this, you know, I, as I encouraged them many years ago, I said, if you can use the youth, you don't have to use the adults in a school system. You know, we, we, we always try to rely on adults too much and adults are very busy people, okay. And except for Okwa, you know, you're retired, so you're not busy anymore. But, <laughs> but so that, that's, and I think that a third bias we all have is that um, we believe technology can do amazing things. And we have uh, listed a lot of episodes, a lot of people doing very interesting things and happening. So we'll probably feature a little bit more of that. But the final bias I think is the biggest is we are all calling for an educational transformation. And which like Sean was talking about, Irene, the, the transformation is not to only to the classroom. It's not only to be managed by one leader. It's new educational players, new educational institutions, new educational landscape, and new educational ecosystem. I don't think right now that's happening, other than a few guys like uh, Gabriel and you know we know we know a bunch of them. I feel like it's happening every day, but actually it's not happening at any <laughs> system level. Systems are still trying to go back and not really rethinking really about how we refund, how we fund our students, how we build learning institutions. You know, uh, many years ago, I've always argued as a, in Los Angeles, for example, a show where you, you might be, as you should never build big schools anymore. Build those little learning centers so kids don't have to do that. Why do you keep building these big, big buildings, you know? And so I think a lot of those biases we want to feature, we want to talk about in the new half year, or not in a half year, in the next, 50 years, which we're going to run this show uh, for that long. So Young, you perfect. want them to answer it one, each of them to take a stab at no, that? No, I, I think I just want anybody to respond to that, you know, I, I, because what, what I'm really trying to do, uh, Kurt, is really to have a conversation about right. any of this. Thing. This is a reflection. This mm -hmm. is a, a inspiration. This is also looking into the future. Uh, you know, I'm, I, anybody, actually, host, guests, you know, uh, I'm more like your yeah. guest today, Kurt, sorry. Yeah. We do have a future question from the, the the YouTube channel, so this fits well with John's question about the future. But anything, you know, any of those things, Tokes, go ahead. Yeah, I do. I do have um, maybe just a response to something that Young just said. Um, I think that while we are, it's it's clear that that the educators, particularly in this room, and and that have been you know on the show, are all kind of we're all looking for that transformation. And that's what we've been talking about since the, since before the pandemic. This is the opportunity for that trans transformation to happen in education. But I think that while we're waiting for that transformation to happen, 
something more exciting is happening underneath our noses. Like innovation is happening under our nose. And I think that um, there are teachers and educators all over the globe that refuse to go back. So I'll just give you a little example. And again, you've, you've seen it in all the episodes that we've had um, with, all, with all the guests that have been on. Um, in, in, in West Africa, there, since the pandemic, there have been a huge number of um, e-learning apps and platforms that have emerged, right? Um, and, and some funding has gone into digitizing the curriculum so that, you know, people have more access and things like that. Yes, we're we're all back in school pretty much at the moment. And we're back to like the overcrowded classrooms, of course. But even in some schools, what they're doing now is because of the, um, because of the, the, the use of online learning as a stop gap, you now don't have to wait for the entire country to shut down before you realize, oh, we could do, you know, if, if one child, for example, comes into, has COVID, is, is tested positive for COVID, that whole year group can shut down and go to online. And so they're using these systems in a much more fluid way. And teachers are refusing to let go of the kinds of tools like AfriLearn and, you know, all those, all those tools, tools that are making um, um, their, their work more efficient and more effective. I don't think they're going to let go of those so easily, even though they're working within systems that are are trying to revert back to what we had before. So in that sense, I think that there, there are some really um, uh, like in exciting things that are happening just sort of at the grassroots level that mean that transformation, although it doesn't look like, you know, what we all kind of hoped it could in the one year that, you know, in, in a year's time or in I think that it's, it's still happening in small steps and we have to, and, and the beauty of Silver Linings for Learning is that it is, it is showing us that, right? Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. Hey, Sean, wants to jump in here? I just want to follow up and build upon what Oaks was, was stating. Um, I, I believe she's absolutely accurate. Educational innovation though is high, happening in spite of policy systems, not being inspired by policy systems. And I think with a place where we were going back even 14, 15 months is that we would be able to come to this point where we are right now, where we're, we're exiting into a, a new sort of system and time era where educators weren't trying to find their way around policy rules in order to make learning happen versus having the capability from whether it be national, state, or systems policies in order to empower teachers in, to, to make learning happen on an ongoing basis without having to bend or break rules. And, and I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. You, you're not gonna, that's not gonna happen from the last two years. And you're gonna continue to see teachers and schools that systems that are innovating in different ways, but it's not in a way that's whole system supported and whole systems motivated and whole systems inspired. And I do think that's where we need to go next. We need to have policy leaders willing to change policies that weren't working before and had proven to be ones that could be changed if not just for a short time on an ongoing basis in order to facilitate learning anytime, any place and making sure that learning is a constant for every student all the time. Gabriel. I, of course, concur with uh, everything that everybody has said so far. I think we're all um, in, in the same wavelength. But I wanted to bring your attention and that of, the, of our audience to, uh, to a topic that is often overlooked when we think about the transformation, and that is the sense of purpose of teachers. Um, when we call out for teachers to step away from being the sage on stage, from not being any longer the indispensable dispensers of knowledge, when we ask them to empower their students to, as, as, as Young said, no, to, to give, give control to our, our students, we're failing to recognize that that is taking a lot away from many teachers that are still in the classroom, that we should explicitly target and work with them in terms of rekindling their vocational call in a world that has totally changed what was demanded of them when, when they chose the profession. 
Um, and I think for one, being in contact with, with teachers all the time, that unless we reclaim the collective self-esteem of the profession, which has been thoroughly uh, you know, lowered over, over the years, especially in many countries like mine, they're underpaid, they're stressed out, they are torn between a collective zeitgeist that says, you know, you should give agency to your students, you should do formative assessment, you should use technology, uh, you should let go of many of your preconceptions, you should target social emotional learning. And at the same time, they have administrators, systems, official requirements, standardized examinations. So it's a really schizophrenic scenario for, for teachers, for educators on the ground. And we need to help them feel good about the transformation. And that surprisingly is never targeted. I, th I think that an essential element in, in moving forward is helping teachers reestablish a sense of self-esteem in their profession and their career. Of all the wonderful things that, to cite just one example, Finland has done in their educational system is making, making, making it happen so that teaching is an aspirational career. If, if, if in, in Finland, the collective self-esteem of the profession is very high. And that not only attracts young people, but it also creates a good feeling. You, you can't have any, any, any healthy order of activity without the people who are protagonists of that feeling good about what they do about themselves. Totally agree. We need the self-efficacy, as Chris often talks about, the uh, mindset or dis dis dispositions to uh, be active and engaged in our learning. Um, we're going to go to Chris after Okwa. Okwa, you want to jump in and make a comment on what, what you've heard? Uh, I can't. Somebody talked about equity. I think uh, not just one person. <laughs> okay. Equity became a big issue, big social issue in uh, uh, education uh, so society. And as a matter of fact, equity is the very sen uh, sensitive uh, social issue in this country. So after the pandemic, uh, we experienced that uh, the equity uh, issue became uh, uh, more, uh, became worse and uh, the, the gap between the uh, um, uh, 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 family with uh, more affluent and family with less uh, resources is enormous. And uh, after realizing that uh, pandemic situation uh, deepens the uh, uh, equity issue, uh, we try to go back to face-to-face uh, uh, -face instruction as quickly as possible. Um, so I think after um, uh, we learned that this uh, 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 online learning can, uh, can create some other uh, social issue, so we try to minimize that kind of social issue but at the same time, we try to take uh, advantage of this uh, uh, new uh, uh, educational situation uh, in uh, during face-to-face -face education. So that's the big social issue now, and a lot of new movement is uh, is is moving on, and. Uh, very interestingly, uh, the application of uh, artificial intelligence is, is becoming very welcomed. <laughs> that's uh, one thing that we uh, experience the transformation of education after the, not after, during this pandemic time. And so, teachers, Opa, when you say we, you're talking Korea, just make sure our audience is aware uh, of that. You didn't say we, Korea. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, surely after this uh, pandemic situation, I think Korean education will experience and will do some uh, uh, very uh, positive trans uh, transformation. Uh, but uh, I think still it is very difficult to, to uh, minimize the uh, equity issue. It is a big, big tackle, big uh, problem for us to solve to minimize that uh, equity issue. 
uh, and I yeah. hope that, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, 20 years ago, my first visit to Korea, I was on EBS education broadcasting system. And the first question they asked me, while they had 96% ban, ban, you know, in, in the country, the highest in the world, they still asked me, what are we going to do about the other end of the digital divide? The first question, what can we do to help people? So in Korea, the antenna has not been recent. It's been there for a while. People have been really struggling and thinking about um, the, the people who are disadvantaged and don't have access. So, um, and I'm glad to see that you're among the people who are helping in that regard. I know you've been doing research in this area for a long time and helping in the government. She's worked on a couple of presidential reports in Korea. Um, I didn't properly introduce Okwa when we started the show, but I'll just say that she's had a, high, a huge influence within the country and do read her work. Um, some of it's in English. <laughs> uh, we're going to we'll move to Chris. Chris, would you like to jump in here? Yes, I would. And I hate to disagree with my fellow panelists, but I see enormous amounts of learning loss. I see politicians who want to go back to the Middle Ages in terms of education. I see college presidents and superintendents and parents who are determined that children are graduate ill prepared for the hybrid workplace by insisting on only face-to-face -face education. It's ironic that the people who are preaching that there's a learning loss aren't identifying who has lost the learning. They think it's the students. Couldn't be more wrong. So I was, I was thinking today about um, an equity issue between Global North countries and Global South countries. And I think one of the impacts of the pandemic, and I'd like to ask um, our guests about this is um, narrowing of the gap between the global south and the global north, which is a good thing. So um, I am doing a lot of speaking now all across the world for free, just sharing knowledge because I can walk down the hall and do it. And what's more, I can give the same talk in in a country with very marginalized resources as I can uh, in a country uh, with a lot of resources because everybody now knows how to use video conferencing. I can show movies, I can you know, do this and that. So this is a great opportunity for the Global South countries that are being smart about this and instead of saying, well, let's go back to face-to-face -face education and leave all the people who had no education before right back where they started. No, they're saying, this is great. Let's take advantage of this new infrastructure. Let's take advantage of new connections between Global North and Global South and, and exchange and share ideas. At the same time, it's the Global North countries, many of them, and we've talked about this, who were busy burying their heads in the sand and, and narrowing the gap by their refusal to understand the nature of the sea change that's taken place. So I'd, I'd like to ask each of our guests briefly, would you agree with this assessment? And um, do you think that, that the Global South countries are going to try to take advantage of it? and really steal a march on a lot of the global north. It looks like Gabrielle is going to jump in first. And I'll try and uh, uh, do about a minute per person so we get around. Yeah. We want to get to Punya's question. He's got a really great uh, wrap up final question. So about yeah, a minute or a minute or two each. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, since I'm in the south, I think I'm, I'm compelled to answer. Um, one of the and, and answering one of the questions that we have on the on the YouTube channel about how can we take forward the lessons. One of the lessons we learned is that we don't need exceptional teachers or exceptional facilities to learn. And that the internet is a, a horizontal world of infinite knowledge that is accessible if we, if we know how to look for it. And as Chris was saying, uh, the internet is a great equalizer. It doesn't, you don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a, uh, the most pristine and far reaching campus in the world. And, and we're all on the same plane. We're all just a few inches from each other as we are now. So that's a great equalizer. Um, meet the students where, where they are in their own digital medium. And uh, it is indeed an opportunity for many to realize that even if we don't have access to super qualified, brilliant, charismatic teachers, there's lots of digital content on the internet, professional quality, well-researched uh, that we can use to in, in, in enhance learning. 
uh, who would like to jump in. Sean, you, you're unmuted, so. Sure. Uh, I think the jury's out, Chris, uh, so far. I do think that the Global South uh, tends to embrace disruptive innovations uh, at a faster pace in terms of being able to utilize uh, what's been made available. But I do think the, the jury's out for the Global North right now. I, I concur with your assessment, Chris, that there's a lot of running around and rallying around this topic of learning loss. Uh, the question is, um, is that even, or should that even be a primary focus on in terms of academics and according to what, according to whose pace and according to, to what sort of standards? I, I'm more inclined at this time to focus on the social emotional well-being of students, their social interactions and other aspects of what is a prerequisite to even getting back into a discussion about academics which ought to have always have been about a process of moving towards self-actualization, which requires steps. Okwa. <clears throat> uh, global North versus Global South. <laughs> okay. Um, we know that internet can be a, a, a super uh, equalizer, but it is, uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, when you have internet, that is okay, that is possible. But even when you don't have internet, how can you get an access to this equalizer? That is a big issue. If you don't have the proper network, if you have no proper uh, uh, devices, you can't enjoy this all the equalizer, all the uh, uh, free. Uh, resources. So the first thing is whether you have uh, electricity, if you, uh, you have uh, internet access, you have a, a, a device to uh, get access to, that is an issue. That's what, uh, what we consider the most when we do uh, the projects in uh, global uh, South countries. So internet is wonderful thing as long as you have uh, access to it. So let's get them have that access. By the way, you just jump, just real quickly, Okwa, you want to share with the audience the countries that you've worked with in the past five years or 10 years, just so they get a sense of the your scope of your work. Mm. Nigeria, <laughs> uh, Nicaragua, and uh, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, so many. Uh, so, so many countries. Uh, uh, Vietnam, Vietnam is a much better place than uh, now than before. Uh, very it's developing very quickly, that country. Very much, yeah, um, yeah. So if you want, Okwa's uh, email is listed in the show that she was on previously. You can find if you want to write to her for one of her reports. Um, I think she was working at Nicaraguan teachers most recently, and there was some civil unrest happening, which caused her the project to be delayed significantly. So she's worked in some dangerous places um, and some not so dangerous places. Talks, I'm saving you for last year, so I want to hear the, what the young person's uh, response will be. <laughs> I love, I love how I'm, I'm the young person. Like my silver is clearly not like helping, <laughs> trying to conjure my. Um, I, I mean, I think I'll echo a, a lot of what Ukwa was saying just now in terms of, you know, there, there are definitely still strides to be made um, in, in terms of overcoming the technical, the, the legal, the infrastructural kind of challenges that we have in order to get access to everyone and, and to really make those, to really close those gaps um, in the way that we're seeing. Uh, in the way that we would like, and in a way that means that there, the gap between the global north and the global south is is really kind of um, eradicated. Um, having said that, I just from like personal experience, I also know that my niece, for example, who doesn't have a passport, didn't have any um, aspirations to 
to to school outside of Nigeria, for example. Well, until I let until I went to Harvard, and then she was like, "Oh yeah, maybe I can do that." But before that, I mean, you know, didn't really have any, you know, wasn't really looking at at anywhere outside of the outside of Nigeria to go to school. All of a sudden, she is now, you know, in she's she's in uni in Idaho, and. It's just like the whole world has opened right from her bedroom in Nigeria because she's doing it online, you know, but the whole world has just opened up in a way that um, I it, it was there before, but it certainly just is not not at the scale that that it is now, you know, I think students who just would never have thought of how can I get to school abroad, for example, from across the world, obviously not just from Nigeria, they now have that access and 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 that is an equalizer that puts them on on the on the same kind of footing as um as their counterparts across the world and i think that yeah it's it's a journey to overcome those infrastructural and like legal and those technical challenges that mean you know um access to internet and and online education and really great quality education is is um has is recognizes the need rather as a basic need um but yeah, but in, in some pockets, certainly we're seeing some, some um, really positive light, so. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And Punya's gonna have a question that might take us to the end. And, and I wanna make sure there isn't like a 10 second, 15 second comment from one of the other uh, co-hosts before we jump to Punya's questions. Anyone wanna make a final comment here? If not, then Punya, go ahead. All right, thanks, Kurt. <clears throat> First of all, I just wanna thank all of you for coming back. Um, it's been a really wonderful journey. And I speak for, I think, our, uh, all the hosts here. Um, for To do this for two years, it's been a privilege. Um, and for you to come back and to continue this journey with us, that's, that's awesome. Um, so just to sort of finish off here, you know, when I look back on these two years, and I think this has sort of emerged in this conversation as well, there are certain things where I feel like we have taken one step forward, other things that I feel we have taken one step back. Depending on the day of the week, I feel positive about the future, other days not so much. It's It's been a weird uh, uh, journey. But just based from your point of view, um, you know, quick comments from each of you on what one positive and one negative trend uh, that you see has emerged uh, in these past two years that you think is going to continue. Um, because I think it's been a mixed bag, you know, to be absolutely honest. Uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, we'll go uh, just step in. Um, we have a few minutes to about 30 so. seconds each, approximately. I and have Chris a is going to introduce one. the next show. Yeah, go ahead. I have a quick positive one is that um, for someone who's worked in inclusive education for over 15 years, I think the day, you know, I long for the day when a student's psychological psychosocial well-being is is of the utmost importance and is seen as integral to their education i've longed for that day and i think that while we're not there yet something that the pandemic has done is draw significant attention to that to wherever like to all teachers wherever they are whether they're doing online school or not doing online school just the sheer loss that that their students have gone through and that they're going through, I think just brings attention to our mental health and mental well-being as part of our profession, um, both for ourselves as, a, as the educators and for students. And so I think that's a positive trend that I, I hope will, I, I believe will stay and, and I hope will continue. Thanks, Tokes. And Punya shared that on the channel. Uh, Gabrielle? One very big positive is that by the sheer force of the circumstances, many uh, ridiculous, outdated, and uh, anachronistic educational dogmas fell flat on 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 their face. Um, amongst them, that social emotional learning was wasteful thinking. We we now understand for once and all that social emotional learning, connecting with your feelings, being prepared to deal with a world that is intrinsically uncertain, is not just something good to have, but an essential skill to learn if we want to survive and thrive in the world that comes. The pandemic proved that too, beyond any any doubt. And the negative, there is, I think there is a big negative and it, it kind of stems from the same, from the positive. And that is that because all of this happened and because many of the uh, retrograde conservative deficit model voices has had were forced into silence, I now see as we speak some antibodies emerging and some very radical positions, amongst them learning loss, 
and and much of the narrative that is that is being pushed in education, a lot of it with you know with the intention of selling products uh, in the ecosystem whose due date has long passed already. So I I detect uh, like a like a collective post-traumatic syndrome, uh, the push to go back to the old normal, to go back to our old ways, to go back to textbooks, sit down, written tests, standardized examinations. I think there's going to be a very big push for that, and that's a very negative trend. Thank you, uh, Opa. Okay, uh, uh, one positive point is that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, Korea, <laughs> Korean education, uh, now uh, push the equipments of e equipping whole country with the proper uh, infrastructure for online learning. Before online learning was not accepted very, uh, I, I mean, we all consider that uh, online learning is uh, only uh, a supporting means and when you have a strong uh, uh, teachers and, and uh, educational resources, you don't need the technology that much. So this is a very supplementary uh, means. But now we all realize that uh, it can be a very strong uh, means for education and effective means for education. So uh, big support, big resource were poured in the whole country to equip with the proper infrastructure. So uh, the Korean uh, schools uh, try to equip all the equipments to all students and proper uh, network uh, connections in our know, uh, classrooms. So that's a very uh, good uh, infrastructure for teachers. But so uh, I'm going to uh, stop you there because we're running low on time. And uh, unless you have fine, wrap that comment up, Okwa, anything else? Uh, the negative is that uh, we rely on uh, 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 efficient teachers much more than before. It's interesting but that uh, teacher's role is much more important than before we realized, yes. Right, good, good one to put in there. Sean, we're ending with you and then Chris will introduce the next show. Thank you very much. I, I believe the positive one I've already covered, which, which is those that have said that after hundreds of years of schooling in one particular fashion and one traditional tradition and style, uh, we've proven it can be done in a different way. You, you don't necessarily have to like every aspect of what was there, but that myth has been dispelled, and that is a good thing. I think the one negative thing is, is that the same people that may have looked at that have been high critics that it can't be done in this way because it wasn't perfect after six or seven months. And I think that's an unfair measure, that after hundreds of years of trying a particular way of learning and not having it be perfected, that somehow after seven or eight months, this other style should have been perfection out of the gate. I think it needs to be given its course and its due. Exactly. Chris? You know, the real contrast is not between face-to-face -face teaching and remote teaching. It's between prepared teaching and unanticipated teaching. That's the real contrast that people are complaining about. So one of the biggest challenges we face in education is scaling up success that we have, and this program demonstrates that, many wonderful small scale things happening around the world, scaling them up, not so easy. Uh, next week, two of my colleagues at Harvard, professors Monica Higgins and Jim Honan, who work in the area of scaling up, will be with us to talk about scaling in the era of the pandemic. So hope to see you then. Mm -hmm.